With YouTube attacking alternative media, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon for just a dollar per month. Link below. Hey, what's going on, everyone? My name is Matt Jarbo. This is Three Buck Theater, and this is all about Chapter One of Star Wars: The Last Jedi Expanded Edition, uh, or just Star Wars: The Last Jedi. The novelization. Now, yesterday I covered the prologue, which is all about uh, Luke having a weird dream uh, about uh, what life would have been like had just one thing gone differently the day he met Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this time, the first official chapter, we got a scene that needed, absolutely needed to be in the damn movie. And this was Han's funeral. Short, but brief yet still effective. Uh, this this entire chapter is all about Leia and her internal dialogue, her internal struggle to get through the funeral of the one man she loved. And it starts off with uh, with her talking with Admiral Akbar. Uh, Akbar essentially tells her, you have to give a speech. She's unsure if she can, but he basically stares her down and is like, we need morale right now. Yes, uh, the resistance fighters were able to take out Starkiller base, but the New Republic is in shambles. I mean, we watched that get destroyed. Mon Mothma's home planet was taken out in The Force Awakens, and now the First Order is ready to strike on the resistance. Even though Starkiller base is gone, they still have plenty of uh, resources at their disposal in order to help take them out. Now, while she's on the base on Dakar, if I recall correctly, uh, she walks off towards the forest, uh, holding in her hand a, a little wooden carving that she places at the edge of the forest. It's her memorial to Han. And, and this carving uh, is very, very, very important to her. And one that I'm surprised that she's leaving behind, to be honest with you. Uh, the, the carving is the same one Han was uh, putting together while they were on Endor 30 years prior, while they were waiting to, to do the assault on the shield generator for the, uh, for the Death Star 2. Uh, he carved uh, a little figurine uh, that she had joked looked like the Ewoks and it was really of her and when he tossed it away in embarrassment she kept it uh, she held on to it for all of those years and walking over to the woods and setting it free was her way of honoring Han uh, and I, that was actually kind of sad I'm not going to lie because I could just imagine that scene in the movie uh, and and her doing that and, and going through that was closure that we, the audience, absolutely positively needed. We, the audience, absolutely needed that level of closure between Episode 7 and Episode 8. Uh, and this this is clearly in the script, but uh, but it wasn't uh, shot. If it was shot, we'll find out on home video. But uh, I do feel like this scene was added in. And not only that, but she's there with C-3PO. 3PO doesn't say anything, nor do they have they explained how he got his gold arm back, considering the fact that that was, again, a plot hole from Episode 7 to Episode 8 uh, that was, like, never really explained. Uh, it ultimately doesn't matter, but I figured they would have said something. But in the meantime, while this is happening, she's giving a eulogy for Han. Uh, and she's talking about some of the things that he has done from when he was a child on Corellia to how he fought for th freedom on Kashyyyk uh, to how he got a general's rank for the assault on Endor um, and, and everything else, how he'd gone back and even saved Luke. And, and that kind of struck me as a little bit uh, interesting because those are some nuggets dropped in uh, to be expecting for the um, for the solo movie. I do feel like those uh, were definitely aimed at. At the audience, uh, at kind of winking to the audience to say, This is what we're setting up for Solo. Uh, we're going to see him as a child on Corellia. Uh, we're going to see him with Chewie and other Wookiees on Kashyyyk. And uh, clearly, uh, that's going to be a couple things that are going to be brought up in that movie. And, and it makes sense. It does make sense that that's something that they'd want to do. And they're going to hold off on that for a while. Um, but another little thing, too, she goes into some internal dialogue about uh, about Han and she she goes back uh, to when they were traveling from the Death Star to Yavin 4 in A New Hope 
and her being a 19, being an ambassador, uh, being a princess, uh, you know, wanted to understand more about Han, wanted to understand more about who he was. So she snuck off and went into his cabin trying to understand what makes him so charming and insufferable at the same time and ultimately found nothing ex that, that came across as a personal token except for the pair of golden dice that was uh, in the cockpit. Again, the golden dice are a thing that were in A New Hope. They were there. And they're clearly going to be something out of out of Solo, uh, and they're clearly referencing that here uh, because they're you know it's going to tie into the end when Luke delivers it um, and everything else. So they are kind of setting that up. But again, when it comes to the the narrative structure of the film and what we saw, uh, again, this entire sequence should have been something that was shown. Um, ultimately what I would have assumed here would have been because she watched the millennium Falcon take off before they had the funeral. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That just feels like a, uh, they would just leave. Why would, why is it that Chewie would, would leave before he went and, and had a memorial for his, you know, his best friend? Uh, why, why, why would he leave? You know, that, that to me doesn't make any sense. Like he would want the same closure with Leia, uh, a person that he's known for decades that he clearly loves and she clearly loves him, um, you know, and everything else. And so why is it that he wasn't there? That That's something I didn't quite care for is it was it was an explaining away of uh, of why Ray and Chewie took off to go find Luke. But maybe at the time it made sense, because, again, as we find out here, that uh, they are aware that the First Order is tracking them. They are aware that they are going to be bombarded any minute, and they are aware that uh, Leia has to rush through this particular um, the eulogy. She has to rush through this, this memorial for a man that she loved for her, her five decades on the planet, essentially, or well, at least three out of the five. And, uh, and now, you know, there's, there's, there's more coming down the pipeline, but there was another little interesting, uh, thing brought up here where she mentions very briefly that, um, the new Republic did not care for her. The New Republic didn't like General Organa. They, they, they looked at her as a war relic uh, and, uh, and everyone who had fallen to her um, under her command for the resistance was uh, simply uh, falling in line with the cult of personality that Leia ultimately uh, was just trying to retain some form of relevance in this world. And I, and I like that little line there because I was always often wondering while watching The Force Awakens, like what happened between Jedi and Force Awakens? What brought about the resistance? What brought about the First Order? And, and, you know, why is it Leia running the show and what's going on with the New Republic and everything else? And that was interesting because she says she makes a comment in there saying that now all my critics are dead. And she's the one leading the charge, whatever few fighters are left, of which there are only a few. She is now the one in charge. The Republic, the New Republic is gone. The First Order essentially can go and take over the entire universe and the only people there to stop them is her. And her legend is one of the reasons why people rallied around her cause. The legend of not only Princess Leia, but General Organa. And I did I did like that quite a bit. I thought that was interesting just that because that it does also kind of feed into the concept of the film in terms of the legends uh, and, and the stories. And that also does tie into to Force Awakens when Rey and Finn meet Han Solo and they're on the Millennium Falcon. And uh, he says all the stories, they're all true. Um, that tells us right there that these stories over the course of three decades have become myth, become legend. And that was exemplified in the film. And that is something that I did like about the last Jedi in terms of like the legends part of it, even if the rest of it wasn't necessarily handled the greatest, uh, in the movie, uh, I did enjoy that. And so this here was kind of setting up, uh, Leia's legend setting up what happens next and why she is the one person to lead it. I would like more detail about what happened, maybe a flashback uh, to what happened uh, with the New Republic and them shutting her down. But then again, they are just trying to keep the story moving along so that I totally understand. But that being said, learning the little tidbits about Han in this particular story, in this chapter was good uh, because it does tell us a little bit of what's going to come from the solo movie 
and it, it, it gives us a little bit more significance about the meaning behind the dice and then why Luke chose to give that to her later on. So that being said, this is a review and a recap of the chapter one of The Last Jedi, the the uh, expanded edition novel. Uh, please leave your comments below. I'm curious to know what you guys have to say. Did you like the chapter? Did you like the edition? Uh, do you feel this should have been the first scene of the movie, that this would have given us the closure we needed as an audience uh, for what we saw in December of 2015 with the death of Han Solo? Be sure to let me know in the comments. As always, my name is Matt Jarbo. If you haven't already, thumbs it up, subscribe, and check back every day for another chapter review and breakdown of The Last Jedi. Have yourself a good one, guys, and peace out.